Greetings comrades! The development of any type of sport in Russian history was usually strongly influenced by the passions of the person ruling the state at a particular moment in time. Catherine the Great adored chess. Vladimir Lenin fell in love with alpine skiing after living in Switzerland. Yeltsin preferred tennis. Putin favored judo. But there is one sport that has seemingly always been in the USSR and Russia. I am talking of course about ice hockey, the sport in which the USSR team was once able to challenge the invincible Canadians. But what if I told you that before World War II Russians knew basically nothing about ice hockey? That 90% of the first Russian teams consisted of footballers? and that the players of the first Soviet championship took the ice in something that looked like bloomers. Our topic today is Russia and hockey. A love story. Actually, hockey was known even in the Russian Empire and was quite popular. But I'm not talking about puck hockey. I'm talking about ball hockey. Bandy. Yes, that very sport that you've probably never heard of, that only Sweden and Russia play, and where every single year it's them who are trying to decide who will be the world champion this time. We'll probably talk about it someday. Today I will tell you why the game came to the USSR so late, almost 60 years after the first Stanley Cup was awarded in North America. How the Czechs taught the USSR national team how to handle the puck. How just 25 years later the Soviet team surprised the whole world in the Super Series with Canada. And 8 more years later gave the USA one of the greatest moments in the history of world sports. Finally, we will move on to modern times and talk about how ice hockey experienced its second heyday in Russia with Vladimir Putin's accession to power. In all honesty, ice hockey did exist in the Russian Empire. There were multidisciplinary sports clubs that tried to create teams for this bizarre game that was born across the ocean. And in 1911, Russia even joined the International Ice Hockey League created three years earlier, but almost immediately withdrew from it, because people did not really want to play with the puck. Everyone thought that the ball was more convenient and just better for the game. After 1917, the situation with hockey in the country has not changed. Ball hockey was the national game, hockey with the puck almost dead. Here's what the magazine Physical Education and Sports wrote about the new game back in 1932. The game has a purely individual and primitive nature, it is rather lacking in combinations and in this sense does not stand up to any comparison with Bandy. The question whether Canadian hockey should be promoted in our country can only be answered with the firm no. no. By the way, this was written after a small international tournament in Moscow where the German hockey club called Fichte came to participate. Then things didn't work out between us and Germany and there was no time for hockey. Anyway, we didn't really think about the sport until the end of World War II. So why was it brought up immediately after the war? The answer is simple. The great and terrible Olympic Games. The IOC had been resisting for a long time and pretended that there was no such thing as the USSR. Until 1933 the official representative of Russia at the IOC was Prince Lev Urusov, who naturally had absolutely nothing to do with the Soviet government. But after 1945 the organization could not help but recognize the Soviet Union. The USSR understood that sports are also a very serious tool for political PR, so immediately after joining the IOC the country began to promote all Olympic sports that existed at that time both summer and winter. To tell you the truth, I have no answer to the question of what has changed in ice hockey over these 40 years after the first attempt to develop it in Russia. But the second attempt was extremely successful. The audience literally fell in love with ice hockey from the very first games. Although at first it was quite a strange spectacle. 
there were of course no real ice hockey players in the country. The first USSR championship was played between the clubs which managed to put together experimental squads of football and bandy players and teach them all the rules of the game in a couple of months. Perhaps it was the unusualness that attracted the spectators. Unusual uniforms, unusual sticks, some small thing instead of a normal ball. But up to 30,000 spectators were present at the big matches of the first championship. The competition was held by the way only for a month and Dynamo from Moscow came out on top. However, it is clear that a month of games was not enough for a serious competition on the world stage. Therefore, it was decided to ask for help from those who already had some experience in the game. The Baltic republics had such experience. Latvia even participated in the World Cup and the Olympics before the war. But the USSR chose another option and more successful teachers. The Czechoslovakian team, which in 1948 has won silver medals at the Olympics. It was they who became the teachers of the Soviet athletes. Most of their players represented the strongest Czech team called LTC, which in 1948 became the opponent in the first international match in the history of the USSR national team. The Czechoslovaks noted that the Soviet players had very good training in all things relating to skating itself, and absolutely terrible training in everything else. They did not know how to lift the puck off the ice, and the goalies did not understand how to catch with their gloves or why they even needed a stick. The Czechoslovakians recall that our players came out for their first practice wearing tank helmets, ordinary leather gloves and football shin pads. But then literally overnight the Soviet craftsmen managed to copy and recreate all the equipment of the opponent. On the very next day the team was wearing actual outfits already. Apparently, the Czechoslovaks were good teachers because only six years later the Soviet team won the World Championship for the first time and at the first attempt, and in another two years the Olympics. However, I'll digress a bit and tell you about the fate of the Czechoslovak team. Because it was tragic. That same year, 1948, the Communist Party ultimately came to power in Czechoslovakia and the hockey players were literally hunted down. Many athletes fled the country. In November 1948, a plane with six national team players disappeared over the English Channel on its way to a match in London. Neither the wreckage of the plane nor the bodies of the players were found. Finally, in 1950, their own government prohibited them from flying to London for the next World Cup. And then the hockey players were accused of anti-state conspiracy and arrested. They signed confessions and received from 8 months to 15 years in prison. In 1955, after the death of Stalin and then Czechoslovak President Gottwald, the hockey players were granted amnesty. Some of them even returned to hockey. After the Prague Spring, all those convicted in that process were rehabilitated. There is even a theory in the Czech Republic that this was arranged by the Soviet Union, supposedly to get rid of competitors. However, already after the first performances at the World Championships and the Olympics, it became clear that the main rivals were not somewhere in Europe, but across the ocean. Of course, I am talking about Team Canada. One of the most irreconcilable rivalries in the history of sports. The first game between the USSR and Canada took place at the 1954 World Cup. The Canadians had been crowned champion 15 times by then. Imagine their surprise when they were crushed by the debutant of this championship 7-2 in a head-to-head -head game. After the emergence of the USSR national team, Canada had not won a world championship for almost 40 years from 1961 to 2004, nor their Olympics from 1952 to 2002. However, let's be frank, at that time Canada's national team in these competitions consisted of amateurs. Professionals were busy with the NHL and did not attend other tournaments. It was not until 1977 that professional hockey players began to participate regularly in major international tournaments for national teams. By the way, fun fact. When Canada was finally able to bring their NHLers to the World Championships, 
led by famous Phil Esposito in 1977, that was the year they suffered the most devastating defeats against the Soviet national team in the history of the World Championships. 1-11 and 1-8. Not the most successful debut. Still, there was one truly great series between these teams before that. I'm talking of course about the Summit series of 1972. A series of 8 friendly hockey games between the USSR and the Canadian NHL players teams. Every single media outlet predicted a Canadian victory. After all, the NHL players then, as now, were the strongest in the world. In a poll of experts conducted by the Hockey News, not one expected the Soviets to win a single game. But the first game in Canada shocked the country. The USSR won 7-3. Of course, then the Canadians pulled themselves together and the series ended 4-3 in favor of Canada with one draw. Still, the matches were far more competitive than one might have expected. It was a stressful, violent and scandalous series, with both sides accusing each other of foul play, deliberate injuries and trying to influence the referees. At the same time, the series also gave a huge boost to hockey in both countries. For example, Philadelphia Flyers coach Fred Shiro became an avid student of the Soviet style and was one of the first to bring Soviet training methods to the NHL. It brought the Flyers two Stanley Cups in a row, in 1974 and 1975. Fun fact, today both countries are actually proud of that series. Canada because it was able to beat the Soviets, which was very important in the Cold War. The USSR because it was able to get the better of the arrogant NHL stars in three games. This series is probably one of the greatest moments in hockey history. Second only to perhaps another game involving the Soviet national team. Unfortunately, I am talking about the Miracle on Ice, which was a miracle for one side and a tragedy for the other. At the 1980 Olympics, competing as reigning world and Olympic champions, the Soviet team unexpectedly lost to a US team made up of almost exclusively amateur players. Even more surprising was the fact that this team was probably the strongest in the history of the Soviet Union. Against them were university students, the average age of the Americans was 22. Yes, many of them wound up in the NHL, but they never became big stars. That's why this game cannot be called anything but a miracle. As for the NHL and Soviet hockey players, the first Soviet player in the NHL did not appear until 1983. And it was a real thriller. Viktor Nechaev actually was never a hockey star. He never even made the national team but he very much wanted to escape from the USSR. So much so that he got married twice. First to an Israeli, but the immigration law was changed a couple of months after the wedding and everything fell apart. And then to an American, called Cheryl Hagler. It wasn't love, it was a cash payment. He told the girl that if she did not take him out of the country, he would be sent to serve in Afghanistan. And after he arrived in the US, he paid her $5,000 and divorced her six months later. In fact, he didn't even think about playing in the NHL. He was just training in Los Angeles with the former professionals, staying in shape. That's where he was accidentally spotted by the Los Angeles Kings manager, George Maguire. Victor managed to get a total of three games in the NHL, scoring one goal then failed to reach an agreement on a contract and was sent to the minor leagues. He did not particularly like it there. Victor said that his opponents were literally hunting for him every single game, chasing him all over the ring shouting go get the communist. All in all, one year in the US was enough for him to give up hockey for good. After his career ended, he began organizing tours of Russian artists in America as well as founding a sports agency that helped Pavel Bure, for example, move to the NHL. Fortunately, by then it was no longer necessary to be fictitiously married and to flee from the KGB. In the 1990s, hockey in Russia, like many other spheres, experienced some bad times. First of all, there was a serious decline in the training of young athletes. 
you need a lot of equipment to train and you need a ring. And neither the state nor most parents had extra money for that. Perhaps the country's bright history of successful hockey teams would have come to an inglorious end if it had not been for one man. And yes, I am talking about Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Vladimirovich admires not only martial arts, but also ice hockey. Although until 2011, by his own admission, he had never been on skates. By the way, here's the video of our president, prime minister back then, learning how to do it. Apparently Putin turned out to be a capable student, because a year later he already participated in the first games of the Night Hockey League, a tournament uniting all amateur ice hockey teams of the country, created at the suggestion of Putin himself. Putin, of course, takes part only in exhibition games, not in competitive ones. They are, after all, going on for almost a whole year. By the way, the biggest fan of Vladimir Vladimirovich helped me to create this video. He has carefully counted the number of goals scored by the president in these league games. Appreciate that, Alexei. By the way, not only the president, but also governors, oligarchs, ministers and sometimes famous ex-hockey players play in these exhibition matches. The same Pavel Bure, Vyacheslav Fetisov, Igor Larionov and many others. In general, hockey has finally become Russia's number one sport. The reasons? It's really straightforward. Number one, Russia does have a lot of talented hockey players, unlike in football. Number two, the Russian team is relatively successful in international competitions, unlike in football. And number three, of course, the opportunity to beat the US team in a head-to-head -head match, based on their recent form, too, unlike in football. Of course, hockey in Russia is not limited to the Night Hockey League. The main league is the Continental Hockey League, which was created in 2008 in the image and likeness of the NHL. Barring some weird stuff like the first Chinese club, assembled entirely from the Americans, the league is quite successful and is definitely one of the two strongest European ice hockey leagues. And you already know all about the successes of the Russians in the NHL. Team Russia, in contrast to the USSR, has slowed down a bit. Only 6 wins at World Cups and Olympics versus 29 wins for the Soviet team. But it can still provide the most vivid emotions, such as the victory at the World Championships in Quebec, with a goal by Ilya Kovalchuk in overtime of the final against Canada, which is still considered one of the greatest sports moments in the history of modern Russia.